right, so God bless you all. Um, this is going to be something that uh, actually I learned about eight years ago, personally, that I sat down and studied. Um, it was something that as a kid that I was told a lot. Of course, it's in the Bible. That's what we're going to go over. Um, but this gate is actually more special and more uh, of a focus from God than we realize. Uh, this eastern gate in Jerusalem. Uh, number one thing I want you to know is that God, Father, loves us so much that he knows what's coming. He, he knows the future. It's a gift that only he has. Uh, he shares it sometimes with his prophets in the Bible. He shares it with his son, Jesus Christ. And But there are certain things that he reserves for himself. Just like Jesus said, he didn't know what day he was going to come back. That, that's something that not even the angels in heaven knew, that only the Father knew. He loves us so much, though, that he sees what's ahead in our life, and he tries to help us. He tries to um, guide us. He tries to send people to interfere in our lives and help us and guide us to the right way. That's the whole reason why he gave us the Word of God, which we call the Bible which many men have tried to rewrite and rechange and everything else, when the truth is you don't need to go do all that. What you need to do is sit down and read what's already written. And a, your life needs to align according to what the Word of God says. That's the real truth. The real purpose in this video is, number one, to proclaim the greatness of God Father and how He sees everything ahead of it. The number two reason is to point you to his son, Jesus Christ, because his son, Jesus Christ, is the literal fulfillment to the promise, which is the Bible, which is the word of God. He is the only answer to sin in our lives. He's the only answer to us getting eternal life in heaven beside God, Father. Um, there is no other way. Uh, this little section here about the the gate the eastern gate has a lot to do because it relates to a lot of us at times to how our hearts there's many things that are closed off in this world there's many things in our hearts that we feel like there's so much against us there's, our hearts have become hard as stone and god can find ways to come to it and all the obstacles that we put against and all the obstacles that we see believe it or not god still can reach us if we're willing to let him part the way just like he did the Red Sea and come into our hearts and help us. So we're going to read a little bit, a few verses, because uh, like I said, it, it's, it's all in the Bible. And uh, we're going to see that men have fulfilled prophecies when their intent was to end the prophecy. Their intent was to know we're going to put this in way and we're going to block this. Okay, We're going to learn that that's not possible. We're going to learn that can't stop the, what God has already seen. You can't stop God Father when he has his mind that something is going to happen. Uh, you can't stop the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he doesn't, he is, the Lord Jesus, a lot of times we see in our world, we, we try to think there's evil and good being the same, uh, fighting against each other. That's just, that's just foolishness. That's, that's not even close to the truth. Okay, the truth is that the Lord Jesus Christ is so far above being the Son of God. He's so far above anything that man or Satan could throw against him that, that there's not even, you can't even come to 1% of the 100% of the full power that God has. Uh, no other being in the world can. That's, that's just a fact. Uh, we're going to see that Jesus doesn't physically have to do anything. Uh, whenever Jesus is almighty in, in the literal sense that he doesn't literally have to lift a finger for anything to happen, okay, to fulfill the prophecies of God. Um, so we're going to start off. This revolves around Jerusalem. That's something that us as Americans, uh, we need to accept the fact that the United States of America, yes, I'm thankful to be in this country. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm very uh, very thankful that, that the Lord has allowed me to grow up here and learn things, but you have to understand that His, the whole world, the center of the world, uh, if there was a one place on the map 
it's Jerusalem. Uh, my personal beliefs is it wouldn't surprise me if that's where the Garden of Eden started. And that's the point that God's making is that he's taking everything back to there. It wouldn't, it, there's so much that are walls around it. We can literally say that that's probably the most fought over piece of land in the whole world. Uh, there's so many people that, that want there for some reason. And a lot of it's because that's where God says that it belongs to his people. There's a lot of discouragement because a lot of things you're going to see over the next years is going to revolve around a lot. And we've seen it already around this place called Jerusalem. A lot of events happen there, especially from the Bible. Uh, that is because that is the center uh, of God's uh, pretty much his, his whole message is centered around that place called Jerusalem for the whole world that's what, that's what he chose okay so um, remember this too though all of us as men and women whatever God shows us it should never be to lift us up it should never be that I'm just so amazed that this person knows these things about God's word that, that wasn't the point uh, the word of God literally tells us that all these things all these gifts given to men was to edify the church was to, to help the church grow was to help the church as a body grow was to help us learn together about God and about Jesus so that we get to know our Lord and Savior more and what happens to when we hear the Word of God, when we read the Word of God out loud, not me explaining it, but just reading the Word of God out loud, our faiths increase because we start to learn that, wow, there's nothing that can stand in His way. All the things that He says are coming to be. You know, this, this great and wonderful and loving man called Jesus did so much for all of us and is still working for all of us. And he isn't done with us yet, okay? So um, he, he has a purpose, and this is going to be a part of it. So let's talk about this eastern gate. Uh, we're going to start off by reading in Ezekiel 44, okay? Uh, I'm going to show a little picture here in just a little bit. Uh, I guess now it's a good time as any. I'm going to show you this picture of this eastern ga gate. Just Took from online. Uh, the picture doesn't belong to me, but I figured it'd be a good example for everybody to see. Right, now we're going, now that you've had a view of that wall in that picture, um, we're going to go through Ezekiel 44. It says, Then he brought me back the way of the gate. That's verse 1. This is the prophet Ezekiel. God's talking to him. He says, Gate of the outward sanctuary which looketh towards the east. And it was shut. And then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, and it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It shall be shut. It is for the peace, the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. Isn't that interesting? It says that he's going to enter by it and he's going to go back out that gate. But in Ezekiel, this is a long time before Jesus came. Okay, because we know Jesus has been that Prince of Peace. We know Jesus has been the Prince, God Father being uh, basically the King of the everything. We know Jesus, of course, as King of Kings, but we know Jesus also as being the Prince because he was the Son of God. Okay, so this gate that Ezekiel sees is this Eastern Gate. And he, he, he literally describes here, he says that God's telling him that this gate is going to be shut and it shall now not be opened. And it says, And no man shall enter by it because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, and therefore it shall be shut. How about that? No, no man's going to open this gate either. So once this gate is closed, now you say, wait a minute. He's, he, so they're looking at this big, huge gate, okay? And the doors at the moment, they're shut. And God's literally telling Ezekiel, there's going to come a day where this gate's going to be shut, and no man's going to be able to open it. But I'm telling you that, that the prince is going to come through this gate, and he's going to 
eat bread and give it unto the Lord. And it's interesting because that's a prophecy, okay? And I studied this years ago, and what stood out to me was like, wait a minute, um, the Eastern Gate, there's a lot that happened and revolves around the Eastern Gate that we don't realize, okay? One of these things is um, that Jesus, in Matthew 21, there's an interesting event that happens that a lot of people look over. That when Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, which is actually a fulfillment to a prophecy back in Zechariah, that says that the, 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 the prince is going to come through and he, this king is going to come through, the salvation, this Messiah is going to come through riding on a donkey. And that he's going to be lowly and he's going to be humble and he's going to be literally the king. So when he comes through riding on this donkey, on uh, this, which we know as the day that he came through, the, the, that Palm Sunday, he comes through riding on this donkey. We don't think about it, but that was actually fulfillment of that verse we just read there in Ezekiel. Because he comes in through that Eastern Gate and he comes in riding on the donkey. And what, what is it that happens? If you read the Bible, you realize that, oh my goodness, they're all praising him, they're all calling him the king, they're all screaming Hosanna because salvation has come. Thus been the fulfillment of the prophecy, which the priests at the time reject Jesus because they turn around and they say, you need to hush them because they're saying these things. And Jesus says, even if I hush them, the rocks would cry out. Meaning this fulfillment of the prophecy is going to happen and there's nothing that we can do to stop it. This is going to be, this is going to happen. We don't see that a lot of times and we don't relate the two, but there's more going on there than just things that we, we just imagine happen. This is probably one of the greatest events other than uh, to us as people, the crucifixion, the offering of Jesus for our sins and the resurrection from his tomb. This is also a huge thing because this is when salvation is, is literally, he's presenting himself as the king. And a lot of people speculate, well, what, what would have happened? Well, there's, there's not really any need to speculate because God already knew it was going to happen. Remember we read over there in Ezekiel and it said that after he comes through and he goes back out that gate that he's not going to be, that that door is going to be shut. And that's the part that we're looking at right now. Um, you say, well, wait a minute. So after he came through that gate and after he went out, what about this offering of the bread? Well, this offering of the bread also happened. And a lot of times we don't think about it, but during that week, that and it happened within days, because during that time that he's all this is happening, that he came through on Palm Sunday, remember that everybody talks about there's such a short period of time between him coming through on Palm Sunday and then all of a sudden him being offered on the cross. All that happened on a short period. Well, what also happened, and it's interesting that it's in the book of Ezekiel, is that it mentions in there in Ezekiel, and the Lord is actually telling Ezekiel that he's going to offer bread unto the Lord. But when Jesus gets all the disciples together and he offers bread unto the Lord, he literally breaks bread. It shows them the example of how they're supposed to do this breaking of the bread and how they're supposed to do this in remembrance of me. Those famous words that he says. He's actually also fulfilling prophecy because that is part of the prophecy that he came. It wasn't just that he was supposed to just run on that dock and come through the door. Part of it also is that he was supposed to offer that bread, which we and, and many Christians have done for thousands of years and probably never even realized it. I didn't realize all these things tied together until just uh, about nine or 10 years ago. You hear people talking a lot about how we do things, but this is just the gift that the Lord gave me a couple years ago, was to start tying all these things together. And it just amazed me that, that the literal sitting down of Jesus with the disciples, offering something as simple as bread to the Lord, that even that was part of a prophecy that just blew my mind. That Jesus, and to those people who may be watching this who are just wondering what this is all about, look, this is just another confirmation that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus didn't just come to be and didn't just take upon himself 
He was literally the son of God. He was literally the Messiah that was supposed to come. This is one of the other little things that he did. He said, well, wait a minute. What about him going back out through that door? Well, there's actually proof that he does go back out that door too. So look right here what it says. It says um, in Matthew 24, which remember Matthew 20, 21 is talking about all the events that happened Palm Sunday. Well, Matthew 24, uh, it's one of the few times in the Bible that this is actually literally just days in the making. And if you read through those uh, verses in those chapters, you realize that this isn't a story that took, these aren't chapters. A lot of times we don't realize it as we're reading, but as we're reading the chapters or books in the Bible, it may have taken days. That may have been days later, it may have been a month later. Okay. Um, you're covering somebody's life and you're doing time frames, so it, it takes a long time, you know. Um, sometimes it gives us references to where this was a month later or this was in the time of such such king and this was in the time of someone else's king. A uh, good example is the book of Daniel. You realize that the book of Daniel, you can sit down and read it in just a couple, maybe a couple hours. But the truth is, if you took your time and read it slowly, I mean, everybody reads at different paces. But you realize that, wait a minute, this story took quite a few years in order for it to come to be that little book. Well, this is one of those instances that if you read it, you realize that the events are continuous, okay? These things happened in a continuous day, okay? So Jesus, after all that happens, and, and he comes in on riding on that donkey on Palm Sunday, um, which even now he gets that donkey is an amazing showing of who he is by itself okay um which i encourage you to sit down and just read that part of the story but jesus literally has again which constantly happened uh, the pharisees and the priests to have problems with him and he literally starts talking to him starts talking to them okay and jesus is standing in there and jesus says oh jerusalem jerusalem this is chapter 23 Thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Those words are very famous to any Christian that's ever studied the Bible. You've heard it in thousands of messages. Look at chapter 24. That's literally the few verses after that. And Jesus went out, this is Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Okay, so Jesus has just left the temple. And his disciples came into him to show him the buildings of the temple. So they've came out of the temple. Okay, and Jesus said unto them, Shall ye not, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto thee, there shall not be one stone upon another, left here, one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Okay? And at first you think, well, that's already been fulfilled. And I was sitting and listening to a man preaching one day, and he was talking about all these little events. And, he, and as he was talking, he was like, well, see, this already got fulfilled in the prophecy. And I'm sitting there, because I had studied this a few days earlier than that. Lord was getting ready to open my eyes and uh, said, what, huh? And then all of a sudden I said, wait a minute though, Jesus doesn't make mistakes. Jesus said there was gonna be no stone left unturned. And I was sitting, I had been sitting a few days ago and I had watched where they had showed everybody on the weeping wall and said that that wall that they all face and they all pray leaning against that wall that's well known in Jerusalem that that was part of the foundation of the original temple, of the original house of God. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, but Jesus says there wasn't gonna be one stone, one stone left unturned. That wall is still there. That's not what he was talking about. I said, this can't be right. That's, that has not been fulfilled yet. Yes, I understand the Romans came in and they attacked and a lot of things were destroyed years later. I, I get all that part of the story, okay, after Jesus. Uh, we know that, that, that the Romans came in and destroyed it. 
I understand. I said, but that can't be what he's talking about. There has to be more to this story. Well, this is where the clue comes in. It says in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, So well, obviously what he has told them has shook them up. Okay? And Jesus tells them, and as they come to him, and he's sitting on Mount Olives. So he's sitting on Mount Olives, and I can just picture him looking down, if you look at the map the way it is, looking down on Jerusalem, looking down on the temple, okay? Remember, Mount Olives happens to be one of the places where he always, he goes to pray. He goes up there a lot of times, okay, to get just his few moments that he gets, that he has to spend time with him and his father in prayer. It says, saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the signs of thy coming and the end of the world and jesus answered and said unto them take heed that no man deceive you if you notice it's very interesting because that's one of the first things that jesus usually always tells us be careful that no man is deceiving you be careful that whoever you're listening to is telling you the truth how are you going to verify that somebody's telling you the truth you're going to have to sit down and study the scriptures for yourself the only way you're really not going to be deceived and even sometimes we're still <coughs> <coughs> deceived by the smoking mirrors <coughs> a lot of times um, because we're deceived by the grandeur of buildings we're deceived by fancy items we're deceived by successful people uh, we're deceived by popular people uh, you look at all the little things that deceive us so easily okay the truth is what we need to do and one of the things to do this is to look back at the prophecies that god has and and realize that remember what we read earlier it says but by hearing of the word of god faith is increased when you sit down and read the word of god and it becomes sound in your ears you start to realize man god does a lot of things when things don't look like they're right, when things that look like they don't make sense, God always has a way of making things be. Okay? So, it's interesting because we look at a lot of things, like I was telling you that the preacher was messaging, preaching in his message, that a lot of those things had already been fulfilled. Well, he, he, he was incorrect. They hadn't been fulfilled yet. Somebody probably taught him. I, I, he's not the only one. I'd heard other preachers mention that before too. And I just thought that was right, that that was all would be. But when the Lord showed me, he said, no, that's that's not the prophecy that we're talking about here. That, that hasn't been fulfilled yet. And you say, well, when is this supposed to be fulfilled? When is this supposed to happen? And, well, it's interesting because um, there is another pro there is another prophecy. Now, what you have to realize also is that when Jesus stands and he says, uh, and he looks back at Jerusalem, remember the prophecy that we read in Ezekiel? It said that the Lord, the Prince, was going to come through that gate and he was going to go back out that gate. But we just read the verses that fulfill that fact. He went through on Palm Sunday and he came back out that door. Because then he goes up to Mount Olives. Mount Olives literally faces that door. So he did exactly what it said. He came in riding the donkey as the salvation. He was rejected and refused as that salvation. So as he goes back up to that mountain, he literally speaks the words out loud. You've rejected me and rejected all the prophets that I've ever sent you. You've rejected every help that I've tried to give you. You're not going to see me again until that day that you see me coming back and you're not going to see me come back until you say blessed is the, is the one that comes in the name of the lord so jesus is literally fulfilling because remember after that happens then that gate is supposed to be sealed and nobody it, that's not supposed to happen anymore so it's interesting because a lot of people want to say and a lot of different religions want to say that they don't believe in jesus they don't believe in god they don't believe in all these things well it's very interesting okay the people that don't believe in prophecy the people that don't believe that say they don't believe all this stuff i want you i want to show i want to read you this and you can look this up okay it just so happens that in 1541 the actual year 
right now we're in 2024 in the year 1541 the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman okay ordered the gate sealed for the final time so it had been sealed several times before Suleiman may have sealed the gate and this is just on Google you can Google it yourself okay Suleiman may have sealed the gate to better defend the city or because he wanted to prevent the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecy of the Messiah's return through the Golden Gate. Isn't that interesting? So here we have a man that's a non-believer, that's non-Jewish, that, that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that doesn't believe, but yet they're still afraid of the fulfillments of the prophecies of God. They still feel like I need to do everything I can do, okay? So it's interesting to me because I also had read and had studied years before of what's actually going to happen on that day when the Lord comes back. Not when he comes to the air to bring back his church. It's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the day that he actually comes back to set foot on earth and literally become the literal king sitting on a literal throne, which he has to do because that's part of the prophecy that he made, that was made to David, that literally said that his son was going to, that he was going to have a descendant that was going to sit on his throne that was going to literally going to be over the world, okay? That son is the Lord Jesus Christ because David happens to be in his line, in his lineage, great-great-grandson down the road. That's something else you can study as yourself. Part also of fulfilling who he actually is because it has to be somebody from that lineage of David. And that is why you have in the books in the Bible, you have several of them. You actually have two different ones that show that through Joseph, he would have been in the lineage, and also through Mary, he would have been directly in the lineage. That is why those are in those scriptures, because that also becomes a fulfillment of prophecy. I couldn't have sat on that throne and fulfilled the prophecy of God. I'm not even Jewish. Okay, I'm, I'm a Gentile who's just drafted in. I'm blessed by grace that I'm even going to be part of the family through the blood of Jesus, okay? Um, Jesus, though, is a literal descendant of, Ju of, of David, which leads him to that ability that he could sit on that throne one day and he's going to sit on that throne one day so as we're going through this it's amazing because that gate since he sealed it is still sealed uh, and actually if you look at that gate and you research it enough you realize that the gate itself is the gate that was rebuilt years later the gate that actually where jesus came in and went through was actually if you're facing the gate from the outside looking in is shortly to the left now another interesting thing because in the scripture, in the prophecy, it says that no man's going to open that gate, okay? So when you start thinking about that, we don't think about the literal word of God like it really is. But I'm going to show you something that really took this to a whole nother level for me. Uh, several weeks ago, I really wanted to get up and I wanted to uh, take my daughter to church. I wanted to go for a little while. Um, I stayed up too late. I didn't feel good and my body was aching. Um, made some bad choices staying up late at night. So in other words, I uh, woke up that Sunday morning, had sit, stayed at home. My wife was looking through YouTube. We were talking about the Bible and we were looking through different things. She was during the Bible. And all of a sudden she came against this, uh, came on this little video. They was talking about the Eastern Gate. And I told my wife, I said, oh, I've studied that. And, and on and on went the little video and it was this little three minute video that really wasn't very long at all okay um and all of a sudden the guy started talking about he said now one of the things that concerned him the most was that um, the people that are now possession of that jewish temple what they have done in order to uh, do the same thing, reaffirm that nobody would ever come back through that gate because a rabbi, which was who Jesus was, a rabbi would not uh, step through a graveyard or step over a grave. It's one of their traditions in order to go into another place. They would always go around. They wouldn't go through. So that alone would stop the prophecy. 
What's interesting because they have made this whole eastern side in front of this eastern gate a literally burial memorial, okay, of all these different people who's passed away. And hopefully they knew the Lord Jesus. And if they didn't, then I'm sorry. But they have made this a sacred uh, burial site to all these different people with these uh, Muslim backgrounds, okay? And over the years and all these different beliefs, they've, they've got them all lined up. And man literally did this to seal this off so that this prophecy, which why would they go through all that if they're afraid, if, if they don't believe that this is ever going to happen? Like, why would you intentionally do that um, is the question. The, que the, the truth is, is because whether we want to admit it or not, Satan fears God. <laughs> Satan does everything possible to try to jeopardize God's word, God's prophecies, God's law. That's what it's all about. Um, you can see it throughout history. God makes the family. What does he do? He puts brother against brother, killing each other. Um, you see it throughout history. He always wants David as a king who's serving God. What does he do? He uses uh, the, the lust after Bathsheba to try to get this king completely taken away. Um, his son Solomon and these are just some of the examples I could tell you examples about myself that are worse but these are just examples that are in the Bible this is what the devil loves to do he loves to instigate this stuff you know he loves to encourage a man to do wrong uh, Solomon tries to do good and builds the temple and does all these things um, what does what is one of the things that he uses? He uses the wisdom of Solomon and Satan tries to tell him, oh, if you get all these women, then you get all these countries that agree with you. And God tells him, he said, all these women are gonna pull you away from me. That eventually happens, okay? And Solomon has to repent and come back, which is basically uh, one of the books in the Bible that you read. Um, basically Solomon's confession that I've made a mess of everything. So constantly Satan is using all these people and things around him to do what? To try to stop the will of God. Well, here's what's interesting. Until that day that I heard that these graves in front of this Eastern gate, that a rabbi wouldn't have stepped over it. I finally, a little light bulb clicked and I realized, wow, that's why everything has to happen the same way that it does. And my wife looked at me and my kids and they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I actually know the prophecy because I've studied it and read it about eight years ago. I know the prophecy of what's going to come and what's going to happen. I said, I always wonder why it was going to be done the way that it was, why it was going to happen. And I said, now I see one of the reasons is because, and I'll read you, I'll read you the verses, and but I'll also tell you where there are so that you can look for yourself. Okay, Zechariah 14, we're going to start in verse 3. It says, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against the nations as we fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in, in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now we've just heard enough about the Mount of Olives that it, we know where it's located. Okay, it's right in front of the Eastern Gate, remember? See, which is before Jerusalem on the east, which it tells you right there in the verses, it explains to you. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east, Okay, now if the Mount of Olives, if you're in Jerusalem and it's the Eastern Gate and right in front of the Eastern Gate is Mount Olives, <coughs> then that means that it's going to cleave towards the east. So it's going to go behind him. You say, okay, well, that's the opposite direction. But look at this. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of towards the east and towards the west. So it's literally going to split right down the middle. And there shall be a very great valley. You realize what that means? There's gonna be a really great valley in front of him and behind him when he sets his foot, okay? Let me explain to you something. Do you realize what that means? That means that that Eastern gate, Jesus is gonna go right, that, that's gonna split that Eastern gate right down the middle is what's going to happen and that literally look what it says and half of the mountain shall be removed towards the north and the other half is going to be moved towards the south 
all the obstructions that man has put in front of that gate is going to be gone. Jesus isn't going to have to speak a word. Jesus isn't going to have to say anything. Jesus isn't going to have to get bulldozers. Jesus isn't has to going to get a permit. Jesus isn't going to have to get approval from anyone. He is the Lord of Lords and he is the King of Kings. And when he comes back to take his throne on this earth, it is literally going to be literally all he has to do is set his foot down and all these things are going to happen. That's who you need to understand who Jesus is. Man has tried all of his usual stupidness to try to slow down the prophecies that's going to happen. It's not even going to come close. Every obstacle they've set is going to be the fulfillment of prophecy. No man's going to have to open that gate when Jesus comes back. Jesus is going to remove the whole mountain and split it right down the middle just by setting his foot down. Not by speaking the words, just by setting his foot down. It's going to split to the right and split to the left. And look what it says. And the mountain shall be removed towards the north and the other half towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley from, and, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall read unto his all. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. That's also fulfillment to a prophecy that's back in Genesis, okay? That it's foreseen that he's going to come with all the saints riding with him. When we come back with him riding on horses, you're going to see all of this coming down, right down through the middle of all this on these white horses. Okay? And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall be shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at that evening time it shall be light. My friends, let me explain something to you. <laughs> that event is going to happen after the seven years of tribulation that's going to hit this world. The worst time that history has ever known to the human people. Okay? That's, that, that event's going to happen. That it's literally going to be dark, dreadful dark, People are going to be after each other. Immorality is going to reign. All these things are going to happen. This day has been prophesied. It's going to be. It's going to happen. The events that lead up to this is a whole different story. A whole different event. This is the day that Jesus comes back as King and Lord to claim his throne. But through the study of this day of his claiming his throne, claiming his position as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings on earth, guess what? Included in it is the literal fulfillment of prophecy that he came and offered himself as the Messiah on a donkey's back. That he came and literally lived and died on a cross. That he gave his life for us. That he was risen on the third day. For people in this world to say, but we don't believe all that. Then I'm going to call a lot of those people. I'm sorry, but you're telling a lie. Deep down, you fear it, whether you want to admit it or not. You fear it just like the Sultan did, that he blocked that doorway. He didn't block any of the other doorways, just that one. That they would literally go to extremes to bury people in front of this gate. Because you think that that's going to stop the God of the only God who truly ever existed. All the other gods are made up. You say, well, that's a bold statement. I'm only making this bold statement because that Lord and Savior Jesus Christ blessed me many years ago. He has never let me down. <laughs> he has always been faithful. And he, as the living word of God, he's going to be faithful in that day to fulfill the prophecies of the word of God that says that he's going to come back and reign on this earth. He has always fulfilled every prophecy that he's ever made. It's who Jesus is. It's who God the Father is. It's who the Holy Spirit is. 
all three of them work together in unison. They all deserve the praise, but it amazes me that in them deserving all the praise, they didn't have to take a second to do anything else, but they love us so much that they took the time to share this with us before it ever happened to give us a chance, to give us an opportunity. Men around us lie and tell us, you believe a bunch of foolishness, yet they seal gates, yet they have an issue with, they, they literally bury their dead right in front of the door. They, they literally go through extremes to try to cut off just in case things happen. You need to wake up and realize that the Bible is real. You need to wake up and realize that the Lord Jesus is real. And the fear in men's hearts is, wait a minute, if he's real, then that means one day I'm going to be judged for my sins. One day I'm going to have to pay for all the things I've done. What, what do I have to offer? My friends, all your riches, all your fame, can't pay for your sins. If all of this is real, the judgment is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. What am I going to do? Well, the only thing you can do is confess that you've done all those things. You said, but it can't be just that simple. Well, you also have to turn away from all those sins. You have to honestly give an honest effort to stop all those things. Man, that's hard. How am I supposed to do that with the best help that's ever been? Lord Jesus Christ, he'll come and he'll help you. When you confess that you need his help, that's the only problem Jerusalem had. He came to him. He showed up. He did his part. He fulfilled it. But they didn't want anything to do with him. You read the stories of Jesus, one of the nicest men that's ever lived. How was he put on that cross for? Because he was telling people the truth. Because he was telling people that you all aren't gonna make it to heaven without him. He was telling people that, you know what? He'll accept anybody, but you need to stay away from sin. Quit going back to sin. People don't wanna hear that. They still don't wanna hear that. But yet he still offers it because he knows that there's a few percentage out there that really want to hear this. Why is this Eastern Gate so important? It's been on my mind for weeks. Building and building and building to finally I was like, Lord, you're just going to have to help me because I don't know that I can share this the way you deserve for it to be shared. But this is what it's for. It's to point you back to him. He wants to come through that gate in your heart. You say, yeah, but you don't understand. I have all these obstacles in my life blocking my heart, my soul for him getting to me. <laughs> you don't understand who Jesus is. Give him the opportunity to show you who Jesus is. Let Jesus show himself to you. And watch what he can do. There's nothing that can stop Jesus. Never will be. Jesus is the son of God and he wants to save you. What you need to do is you need to confess your sins. You need to turn from them. And you need to literally call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He will come to your heart and save you and help you, same as he's going to come to that throne and reign, because he wants to sit on your heart, and he wants to reign in your heart forever, same as he wants to sit on this throne. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. He's faithful. He will fulfill God's word. And what was Jesus, my, my favorite words that Jesus said was any man calls my name, I won't deny it. I'll come to him. Jesus loves you. Hope this helps you. Hope it blesses you. Don't look at me and think, man, look at the things this guy knows. Instead, pray for those that don't know Jesus. Show them this, maybe to help them. Either way, don't forget. Jesus loves you. Y'all have a blessed day.